But think about this. The earth was incarcerating the devil and his host, his insurrectionist host. Who knows how many they are? Then God decides to renew the earth, to renew the terrestrial realm in his kingdom, and to appoint a new regent to govern the earth. But this time, he's not going to appoint one of the other sons of God. No, this time, he's going to create a new species. Dude, I somebody sent me a message on uh, Instagram saying that when I talked about the bullet, the bald mullet, I think that was with had to do with Doug and and Judd. I said it was yeah. the greatest thing ever. And it is. Hulk Hogan's got a bullet. He's he's been doing it for a long time. When it comes to 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 Luke's love languages, hair is up there. And I was watching the Andre the Giant documentary just randomly this week. I'd seen it already. Have you seen that one? Mm. We mm. talked about him. Was it? It was Doug Van Dorn that brought it up. Doug, yeah. That is just fascinating, man. The dude is. He's just huge. It was just oh, yeah. crazy. Have you ever seen this picture of his hand holding a holding a beer? That, you, you bring that eighties eighties love to the show, dude. I just I loved wrestling in the eighties, and that's where it stopped. <laughs> that's where it stopped. Yeah, shout out to our boy Lanny. Lanny loves some loves, wrestling. Loves him some wrestling. It's cool to get to know you guys out there. Lots of people message us consistently. Feels like we're developing kind of a family out there, Luke. Yeah, we joke about BlurryCon with, with Doug and Judd, and maybe someday. Maybe someday it's we'll... It's getting closer every day. If you guys keep sharing this podcast around, we're going to have to do it. Right. Every day it gets a little bit wilder on Blurry Creatures. Sure does. And we're about to get wild again with one of our marathons. The myth, the man, the legend, Tim Alberino. Tim Alberino. Did he, he dropped a trailer this week. Yeah, he did. We'll talk to him about that, I think, when he gets on here. But he dropped a trailer this week. It was pretty awesome. Yeah. No words, just a lot of epic music. Epic music, chasing legends. Yeah, he's working on a uh, series, and uh, yeah, I'm excited to see what that's all about. He's been sending me little clips here and there. We text from time to time. Dude, you're such a big, you're such a big deal. Everybody, everybody wants to be Nate, Nate Henry's nah. friend. Now nah, you're on the you're on the Jed text thread now, Luke. So you're in. Yeah, but I get added. I think out of just people feeling bad, they're like, maybe we should put Luke on here. You know? But you're out. You're busy texting MJ and. Troy Aikman. Send the quiz, Troy Aikman. Yeah, me and Troy, we got on our, <laughs> our big our big text threads. It's great. Yeah, oh yeah, I know you do. Yeah. Don't don't hold back on us. Troy's like your little person. If there was someone I would, that I would think I would like to text more than more often than not would be Marshawn Lynch. Okay, I got a ton of. I used to talk to Marshawn once once a year. He would call me. He'd call you once a year. Yeah, and it was always the same time of year. It was right on the Pro Bowl. He'd just call you and say, "What's up?" Just, just say, "What's up, man? Are you gonna go to the Pro Bowl?" No. Oh man, who am I gonna hang out with? <laughs> I don't know more Sean. I don't know more Sean. He's a great. So, and the reason I was thinking about that is he was on on Monday Night Football this week. I don't know, man. Something about him. He's such an authentic human being. He's just a great dude. Just really great dude. Great heart. Brilliant dude. He spent the guy literally spent mm. none of his NFL money. Now he was living off his endorsements. He's a smart guy. Huh. Right? Speaking of endorsements, Blurry Con. If you want to help us to get to Blurry Con, keep spreading the show. Keep telling your friends. We appreciate you guys out there listening. Keep moving up in the charts. Getting a little higher. Hitting new countries, new charts. It's fun to see people spreading the blurry creatures love. Got a lot of cool stuff in the pipe and a lot of members jumping on board, Luke. Nate, Nate you're doing these things now on, on Instagram where you're it's you in front of it looks like you're playing anchor man. Yeah. Just just like who's 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 running the teleprompter? I need to know. Kids like it. Kids like it. <laughs> I don't even know how you do that. I'm like, this is this is when I start feeling old. Like, man, how do you do that? That's pretty cool. People send us messages, they see centaurs out there and we gotta put it on the old feed or they see weird stuff or it's just a, it's a way to create content and throw it out there and be like this is what we are this is what we do sometimes people don't a lot of people don't know how to download a podcast Luke. they don't even know how to do it they don't know how to find a podcatcher app type in their podcast and download it they don't know how to do that yeah. i mean consistently people say how do i listen this is my dad my mom and dad do it they listen all the time they get on the old itunes and push the button subscribe yeah, yeah. there you go See, we're, you're Space a pro. Show, shows up in your on your phone once a week. Hey, Tim. Oh yeah, yeah. Sounds great. Yeah, it sounds good. Can't see you though. It's uh, yeah. Texted me that he's uh, doing his laundry. He's only in his, he's only got under clean underwear right now. So we, uh, you're not far off from the reality. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, 
The history of our Earth is so different from what we can imagine. Enjoy the journey. The Smithsonian, that if they found out about a large skeleton somewhere, was to go get it. I'm going to assume at least one person is right, because if one person's right, it busts the paradigm. It all goes back to the fallen chair. And the problem with the modern day church, they have a very truncated view of the supernatural. This backdrop is just pregnant with all kinds of meaning associated with this Mount Hermon event. And this guy defects from the kingdom. That's a big deal. Man, Tim, we can't say thanks enough. You're you're on the show again. Uh, a lot of people love it. Every four or five episodes, another mind grenade. So it's it's been cool too, Tim. Like the feedback we get is just it's pretty amazing. They, I mean, people love your book, but they also love to hear you riff on the book. And like, in this space has kind of become some of that, and also expounding upon some of the thoughts and and unpacking that. We appreciate you being here. We appreciate you, you know, your point of view, especially when it comes to all the stuff we try to make sense of here. Well, the pleasure is mine. I appreciate you guys having me on. I always laugh when I think about our channel, Luke, and we have all these goofy memes and stuff. And then Tim gets on. I'm like, "What does he think about? What does he think about blurry creatures?" <laughs> I actually, I actually find your memes to be quite entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. You know what? I, you know what I love about blurry creatures is like several of the wives, like Heiser's wife, your wife. They're always laughing at our memes, and I'm like, "We're winning over the ladies of our guests." It's fun. They like, they like. And that's they all that matters, right? right. Yeah. And they're like, you should go back on Blurry Creatures, honey. All right. Yes, we did it. Tim, uh, you dropped a trailer this week. Actually, it was yeah, it's fantastic. Can you talk a little about what's going on in that realm as much as you can talk about it? I'm ready to watch whatever you're putting out there. Well, as a lot of people are probably aware by now, I've been working on a project for three years, a project that was picked up. It's a TV series. It was originally picked up by the History Channel and was supposed to air uh, two years ago prime time on the History Channel, and it got dropped for reasons that I can't go into right now, but uh, suspected mm-hmm. reasons, I should say. So that was abrupt and kind of caused us to have to rearrange some things and frankly, go back to the drawing board and reproduce th- some things. I'm working with Gary Haven. Gary Haven is my partner. We created a new production company called Intrepid Films. And so Gary and I have been working on this TV series. And the TV series is, I think it's well-defined as it's sort of like True Legends 2.0, for those who are familiar with the True Legends documentary series that I did with uh, Steve Quayle some years ago. Yeah, Um, It's much more oriented towards a larger, more general audience. It's not niche-oriented like the True Legends series was. Uh, So we don't... Um, try and frame everything we're talking about within the Genesis 6 space, let's say. Uh, it's much more open-ended. It's much more investigative. We, we weave in our own personal perspectives, which obviously are biblical perspectives, without majoring on the biblical perspective. Yeah. Alienate people. Yeah, and just to try and expand the audience. And uh, so that gives you sort of a feeling for mm. the kind of content. It's not Genesis six centric, although we we are going to be weaving in the topics hmm. that we discuss hmm. all the time. But I mean, in this series, I'll be going after live giants in the Solomon Islands. I'll be looking for Bigfoot in Montana. I'll yeah. be um, I'll be pursuing the notion of uh, do stargates exist? Uh, we'll be talking about you know we'll be doing doing some. Oh, you've been holding back on us, Tim. Well, we'll be doing some debunking <laughs> too. You know, well, I'd like to go and debunk some things that are out there floating around. So it's like an investigative scientific team that I'll take with me, depending on where I'm mm-hmm. going, what I'm doing. And well, I appreciate um, your like more scholarly way of v- reaching a bigger audience because on blurry creatures we just make memes about ghostbusters and which is probably more effective than anything i would ever do <laughs> well tim we love it man we we love we love your passion because like sometimes we feel like just a couple of goofy guys and you have a lot of a serious content and we love how we both kind of preach uh, approach the gospel in different ways a lot of people say you know what they like the blend of how we bring on these uh, people who drop this hardcore knowledge on us but the way we try to package it is more asking questions, not, and you know, have fun with the memes and, and the content and the music and just make it a enjoyable listening experience. So 
you know, if it gets too goofy, no, it's I, too goofy. I, I love right? the memes. I love the memes. Well, I, I, listen, I am a, I am a child of the eighties. Now I grew up most of my young life was in the nineties. <laughs> there we go. But I grew. I, I was born in nineteen eighty three. So, you know, if you're born in nineteen eighty three, by the time you're ten years old in nineteen ninety three, all the movies that you're watching on TV, not just regular TV. Are the movies from the eighties? Most of them, right? Oh, yeah. Right? They're getting yeah, rerun yeah. on 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 tel- By the time they make it to television, you know, it's it, they don't they don't hit tel- They didn't used to hit television. Now they go to streaming right away. But they didn't used to hit television for two couple of years, right? They would run through the theaters and everything, and then the rentals, and then eventually they. they so I I I I love the eighties. In fact, I'm very nostalgic <laughs> for the eighties. I love eighties music. I love eighties movies. <laughs> I love the me. I love the eighties meme. There's these times when I'm like doing the Photoshop work. And I'm like, I wonder what Tim will think about his, his mug on the cover of a Nintendo power. I love it. Magazine. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> well, I had Tim, Atari, I, Nintendo. Uh, oh yeah. Yes. I, all of it. We got to We got to jump in these topics. Cause I'm sure we could talk for an hour and a half about all the, the good stuff of the, of the eighties, the eighties yeah. yes. before we hop into the Satan's domain. Cause that's what we, we were texting about. You want to do an episode on Satan's domain. I, I, I hesitate to ask this question cause we go off on a rabbit trail, but I know you get a lot of emails about creatures and giants and things. Do you have any updates on any of the Genesis six topics before we dive into Satan's domain? Some like, cause you're talking about going to Solomon. Well, Islands, I will say this, like, this, the, the, the most, uh, important thing happening right now um, in terms of any of that is the, is the alien stuff. And um, there's, there's all kinds of things happening now. I mean, the, as I've said before in our previous conversations, you know, the, the, the UFO phenomenon that is getting more aggressive and it's becoming apparent. Even NASA is now beginning to admit that there's a hostile there. And when I say admit, I don't mean they're coming out and saying this directly there. It's very subtle. Uh, mm-hmm. But they're but they're subtly signaling that there's a hostile alien force out there. That to me is is the most incredible thing because nobody's out there admitting the existence of giants. Nobody. I mean, in terms of mainstream organizations, that's so weird. Nobody's right? exi- out there saying that fairies exist or that stargates exist or that uh, centaurs were real. No. However. Almost all of the major institutions, governmental institutions, are now having to deal with the alien question, which I find mm. fascinating mm. because that's a Genesis six-like topic that is now becoming mainstream, and so I yeah. find that fa- I find that fascinating. Yeah, and the Ancient Aliens crew is pushing a lot of that stuff too, and we see more and more on the channels that we follow that these it, these two it, kind of narratives are converging. Ancient so. Aliens, by the way, let's let's disarm right away people's problem with trying to deprogram people who sub- subscribe to ancient aliens ain't the ancient aliens narrative is is not as dangerous as people think it's misguided and it's misconstrued to some degree by the ancient astronaut theorists themselves but the premise we should not be afraid of the premise we yeah. should not feel threatened by the premise of ancient aliens. There were ancient aliens, according to the biblical narrative. I mean, it's presumed in the biblical narrative that ancient aliens existed and exist. We call them angels. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't, certainly wouldn't use the term demons for ancient aliens because demons are a relatively new phenomenon in terms of uh, the, the, the unknown history of the universe. Uh, demons are, in, are an earthborn phenomenon. They're, they're not from elsewhere in the universe. They're from the earth. In fact, one of the definitions of Nephilim is earthborn. Hmm. So, um, demons and giants, that's an earthborn phenomenon. But when you talk about, as we've talked about, we won't go down this path any further, but as we've talked about in terms of the, these ambiguous entities designated angels in the biblical narrative, these are, in fact, ancient aliens, and they have been interacting with mankind from the very beginning. So we can accept the premise. We can agree with the premise, the premise of the ancient, ancient astronaut theory. Where we part ways is when the ancient astronaut theorists begin to talk about this notion that the aliens, that the extraterrestrials created us. Right. And yeah. e- even in the first steps down that path, we can, we can be in accord because if you if you assume that the creator the maker is not earthborn 
then, and this is a stretch, but you could consider him to be extraterrestrial, but that's really not a, a very accurate description of, of, uh, of the creator of the universe. He's ultra terrestrial or something of that, uh, something like that. He's not from anywhere exactly. So, but where we definitely part ways is where they want to say that we were created by the Anunnaki. Yeah. That would be like saying that we were created by the watchers or we were created by the angels themselves, which is of course inaccurate. We were created by, and, and this, I'll be very specific, according to the scriptures, we were created by the son of God. So, mm. Um, and to say bluntly, we were created by Jesus. The, yeah. the, the Bible denominates Christ, specifically denominates Christ, the Son of God, as the maker, the creator. Now, he created everything. God created everything through him and by him. So, the Father was involved, obviously, here as well. But, but everything was created through, through Jesus. So, that's the biblical narrative and, and only that. Tim, I think I think it's interesting, Tim, too, on, on that whole thing. That like the flip side of that is that when they talk about the ancient alien theorists, talk about the aliens creating us, that is really just like the the antithesis gospel of the Watchers or or the Enuma Elish. You look back in in history, and you have these creation stories where they put the serpent on top of the creation, right? And this is exactly what we're seeing repackaged and and sort of re reused right it's, i mean this, it's is, the this inversion is not of a the truth yeah right it's nothing it's not a new thing this is the old thing just with new new words attached or, or yeah new no, new nomenclature yeah and and of course they believe in ancient astronaut theory specifically is heavily based on Zachariah Sitchin's faulty erroneous interpretation of of the Mesopotamian cylinder seals i mm-hmm. think mike heiser pretty much puts the nail in that coffin yeah. Um, and uh, Sitchin was not the scholar that, and I'm not saying he was a dumb guy. I mean, Sitchin was a brilliant man for sure, but he was not Semitic language expert that ancient astronaut theorists uh, credit him to be. And so mm-hmm. they're building their house on sand. And and it's, yeah. it's very easy to dispel. Yeah. Heiser said that on our show. On our episode, he said he has thousands of documents that haven't been released that can blow holes in all of their. Of theories. course, yeah, because again, they're building the, the whole. Their whole theory is is based on the Anunnaki, that the human race was created by the Anunnaki splicing their genes with uh, Bigfoot, basically with a hominid species on this planet, a, a primordial hominid species that was existent on the Earth when the Anunnaki showed up. They spliced their genes with this ancient hominid to create a slave class of sentient beings, which right there, you know, I was talking to somebody, I don't remember who I was talking to the other day on a radio program. Right there, we have a problem because if you're going to, if you have the technology to get here from another star system or another planet, then you, you have artificial intelligence and robotics. You have, you have a spaceship. I mean, you, you have something approximating artificial intelligence and robotics if you're getting here in the first place. So why would you need to create an organic, a genetically altered life form to harvest gold? Wouldn't you already have the robotic, the, the yeah. robotic capabilities to do that? Wouldn't you already have the ability to do that without having to use biological life forms? Or couldn't you create drones or something? It just doesn't make any sense. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it, it doesn't make any sense that, that they would create a slave class of human beings who could revolt, who would be difficult to control, it just makes no sense. It, it, it's so it's just science. It's just science fiction. That's all it is. And so we really shouldn't be afraid of it. Uh, we shouldn't be confused by it. The premise is true, and that's I think what grips people is I think everybody understands that there's there's something, or at least it, um, it discerns the the fact that there is something about the ancient astronaut theory that is true. That the premise is true. It's like Christianity with no accountability, kind of, really, if it comes down well, to Well, it's it, like it's Christianity like, with, without the Christian God. Right. And without any consequences. Right. Any- and without Christ, which would render it not Christianity. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gospel of sorts um, that, that, they, that they subscribe to. And, of course, the ancient astronaut theorists are so eclectic. There, there's, not, there's not one specific doctrine. They're all over the map. Some of them believe that the gods are good and they're coming back, and others believe that they were evil. It's just all over the map. So, we shouldn't... The, the point is, I went on this long rant to say we shouldn't be afraid of ancient astronaut theory, uh, ancient aliens. Uh, ex- ex- agree with the premise. 
but reject the notion that the aliens made us. So that's a good segue, Tim, talking about Christ specifically that we've talked about on our show extensively, that Christ being the Son of God, the Creator, having dominion here because he was born of human beings. So he has domain here. And there's been a lot of discrepancy amongst the church because I've heard many pastors in my lifetime say things like, Satan is the ruler of this world, you know, things like that, Luke. And specifically a lot of confusion in the church and people who listen to these podcasts are like, yeah, well, how much power and domain does Satan have? And we've talked about abdicating authority a lot on our show too. So what are some different things that um, we haven't talked about specifically, Tim, that you think um, when it comes to Satan, his dominion, his domain on our show that are helpful? We never really dealt with, the let's call it the presumption that, that Satan is the ruler of the world. And that is the presumption from which most Christians are operating. When I think about the devil and the forces of darkness, what people call fallen angels operating on earth. But this is a very important question because people in our community brandy these terms around uh, quite often, fallen angels and the, the ruler of the world. And we talk about the devil's influence in the world. But do we ever really stop to think about what the context, what is the context of that authority, of his authority? And not, and not just the context, but what is the scope of his authority? And to put it more clearly, is what kind of functional authority does the devil have in human society? What kind of pragmatic authority does he have? And this is a very nebulous topic. Most Christians don't think about this. Most Christians assume, again, they presume that the devil is this, has all this authority over everything that's going on on earth, that he is directly involved in every aspect of what's happening. But that is not certainly not the way that that he's depicted in the biblical narrative. Is he trapped here on earth? Can he leave earth or is he stuck here? That's a very interesting question. That's a very interesting question. The, and the answer is, I don't know. I think he was trapped here for a long time. So we can start there. I believe that the earth, before the creation of mankind, that the earth functioned as, as a prison of sorts for apostate sons of God. Hmm. And these apostate sons of God were involved in a conflict, in an in, in insurrection. It's interesting that, as a little aside here, that a lot of the terminology that I use in my book that was uncommon terminology for these kind of subjects has suddenly become very, very common terminology in our vernacular. Like, for example, dominion after the election last year, we're coming up on almost the, the year anniversary. Dominion began to began to enter everybody's vocabulary because of the dominion voting systems That's that uh, people think were rigged. And then, and then insurrection. Mm hmm. So you have these two term, terms that are that are constantly on everybody's lips, dominion and insurrection. And uh, it's funny because those are two of the main terms that you'll find repeated throughout my book. So you are a trailblazer, Tim, <laughs> in every sense of the word, right? <laughs> well, it, well, it was interesting because because I had to try and think about these things in in different terms, because the old terms that I was used to growing up in church were not sufficient to tell the story. They were not, yeah. they didn't have the explanatory power that I needed to fully grasp the story that was being told. And, uh, and of course, the biblical terminology isn't, isn't our terminology. The biblical terminology is the terminology of the ancient Near East. And that's a very important point. And it's a, and it's a subject all in and of itself. So th this, this idea that there were these apostate sons of God incarcerated on earth the, the, then we have to walk that back. Well, why were they incarcerated on earth? And, the, and the, the answer is insurrection. That's the answer, insurrection. And when we say apostate, it's not exclusive to the idea that you have defected from the faith. We think that the term apostate, which comes from apostasia, the Greek word apostasia, from which we derive the word apostasy, the great apostasy, that that is indicative of a defection from a religious faction. In other words, falling away from the faith. But that's not what the word really means. Apostate uh, or apostasy, it's more indicative of an insurrectionist, someone who has committed an act of sedition against- ha Hatched a plan? 
Yes, against God, who's hatched a conspiracy, committed an act of sedition, and is an insurrectionist. And we've talked about that. We've talked about that a little bit on the show before about how, you know, I think it was Edom. Um, Edom, like a, that's right. Yeah, there was, there was a planet, right? And it exploded. And so that's why I was asking well, you specifically. Oh, yeah, Rahab was I the planet. I think Edom refers to Mars. Yeah. And that's what I was thinking is like, is Satan still trapped here as he's going to and from? Well, he was. So this it, is, I believe he was in the beginning. And again, the, the reason why he was incarcerated here is because of the insurrection. That was a result, a direct result, a consequence of the insurrection was that these apostate sons of God, we call them fallen angels. And most people now, I think, are familiar with the fact that I don't really like the term uh, fallen angel. It doesn't offend me. Yeah. I don't care if other people use it. <laughs> but it's a, it's more of a contrived term, and it and it gives us a, a the wrong idea that these angels had their wings clipped and they fell to the earth. No, they didn't fall to the earth. I think they were incarcerated here because they were insurrectionists, because they had committed an act of sedition, and in fact, open war with the King of Heaven, i.e., Christ, i.e., the Son of God. Do you think that's a little weird though that they're pr- imprisoned where we are? No, because I think it's I think it's very important to understand that dynamic because there was a war, they lost this their insurrection failed, and as a consequence, uh, the leader of the insurrection, whose name by the way is not Lucifer, uh, that's a misnomer. Uh, we call him Lucifer just because it's it's gained traction over the years and become it's become part of our vocabulary when talking about these things. But the Bible actually never names this character. And I always say this because it's the most apropos um, example, illustration that I can think of. It's it's very much like for those who have seen the Harry Potter series. Yeah, yeah. We've Voldemort. About that, yeah. Voldemort is, they, they never say his name or hardly ever in the beginning, at least of the series, they would never say his name. Because it was he who should not be named. Well, it seems interesting because if you have like a, let's put it in practical terms, you've got a chicken house and then you got these foxes. Why would you put the foxes with the chickens? Because we weren't the chickens. That's why. Now let's move forward in time. So you have, as a result of the insurrection and the apostate sons of God led by the apostate, who, if there is a title for him in the Bible, that title would be the dragon, of course, the devil and Satan. But the dragon, I think, is the most appropriate title for him, although that's not his name. His name isn't the dragon. His name isn't the Satan. His name isn't the devil. And his name is not Lucifer. His name is never given to us. We're not, we do not know his name. We're not supposed to know his name. It's he who should not be named. He he committed such a horrendous act of sedition against God that that it's 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 shameful to speak his name. Basically, is the idea right? So mm. he's incarcerated in the earth. And remember how we find the earth in the beginning of Genesis. It's it's darkness was a, was that water covering the earth and darkness was upon the face of the deep. So what we have here is a veritable prison. If you're incarcerated within this watery grave, this this watery tomb let's say, in the inner earth, then you're, you've been imprisoned there. And I think that that, that is exactly what we see in the beginning. And, 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 and I think that incarceration was definitely, it was a forced incarceration. And there were elements, good guys, let's say guardians watching the earth to make sure that the, the prisoner didn't escape, right? And then you have God deciding to renew the earth. And those who are familiar with my book will understand why I'm saying this. And and I go through all this in the book, the scriptures that I think verify the fact that the earth was not created initially initially in in the first chapter of Genesis, but rather renewed, that what we're seeing is a renewal of the earth in the aftermath of judgment. So, do you think the earth and Eden are different locations? Yeah, I do. But think about this. The earth was incarcerating the devil, water covering the face of the earth. So, this being and his host his insurrectionist host, who knows how many they are, are incarcerated in the earth. Then God decides to renew the earth, to renew the terrestrial realm in his kingdom, and to appoint a new regent to govern the earth. But this time, he's not going to appoint one of the other sons of God. No, this time, he's going to create a new, a new species, a brand new species who would have no remembrance of things that occurred who would not be tainted with the, the events of the past. In other words, they, this would be a, a new being that was, that was freshly created who would 
be unaffected by things that had happened previously to his existence, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And this makes sense if if he's being created in the aftermath of a massive war, a massive conflict that that, that resulted in the utter destruction of our solar system. And so, uh, Adam is created, and he's not created as just some, basically, the upgrade of a chimpanzee, you know, a naked ape, uh, a hairless ape. No, he, he's much more like the other sons of God. He's created like the other sons of God. He's given their capabilities, our rational thought, our emotional complexity, our ability to communicate complex ideas uh, through vocalization, and I think in the beginning through telepathic communication, I think hum- human beings are inherently telepathic, although we've lost that capability among others. And so we were we were really quite a remarkable race in the beginning, and we still are compared to other creatures, but not not so much compared to the elder race, uh, the the angels. So at this point, Satan is separate from us on the earth, but we were created in the garden. No, not necessarily. So the earth, so you can imagine this, the, the devil's incarceration ends when the waters subside and, and the dry land mm. appears and the earth begin, undergoes this process of renewal. That would affect, that's effectively like opening the gates. And, but there was a new sheriff in town at that point, Adam. Is there something about the water specifically that traps him there, you think? Uh, probably. So... Um, I would imagine that they were in a pretty pitiable state in the earth and probably in the interior of the earth. These beings who are very much like us, they, they don't have wings. They can't teleport from one point to another. That's why they use vehicles of conveyance in the scriptures. Um, they have to eat and drink. They have to sustain themselves. We got to do an episode on a hollow earth here at some point. Well, we are talking, <laughs> we are, we are, uh, right, Luke? We are yeah. approaching a hollow earth um, paradigm here without exactly zeroing in on a hollow earth. I right? don't know anything. I don't really know a lot about it, but it seems like we constantly get that, those questions and comments, Tim. Well, we're definitely approaching a hollow earth paradigm here. So there's something going on where the devil's incarcerated, I think, in the inner earth. And when the dry land appears and the water recedes, and that's effectively opening the gates. And But there's, as I said, there's a new sheriff in town, and that is Adam. Adam is now the regent of the earth. And I'm going to make a statement, and a lot of people are going to be shocked by this statement, but, but it's borne out in the scriptures. Adam is the supreme authority on earth at this point. Now, he's, he's subservient to the maker, in fact, to the council of heaven. He's subservient to the kingdom of heaven, to the powers of heaven. But on earth, he, is, he has dominion over everything, everything on earth. He has dominion, including the apostate sons who were incarcerated there. Do you think he knows them at this time? He absolutely knows who they are at this time. Okay. He converses with one of them openly. And so he knows who his older siblings are. Adam is going to be very well aware of, of obviously, who, who, who his maker is, first and foremost. And he's communicating with his maker, but he's obviously also communicating with, with this entity we call the devil and who is, who is a member of the elder race. So, it's not a, so let me say this. It's not a serpent, and it's not a serpentine being, and it's not a, it's not a, a reptilian Adam and Eve would have been communicating with beings for the, in terms of when we talk about the angels would have been communicating with beings that look very much like us hmm. and uh, are, are pretty much like us in every way, but they're not us in terms of they're not human beings. We're human beings, but we were made in their image. And people say, what, what do you mean? We weren't made in the image of God. Yes, we were all made in the image of God. All of the siblings were made in the image of their father. Uh, and so Adam and, and Eve would have been freely communicating with their siblings. And people say, where's that in the scriptures? The parable of the prodigal son. The parable of the prodigal son, which we've talked about on your show, where there, you, have the, you have the younger brother and the older brother. They're siblings in the same house. I think one of the more confusing things for me on this show, Tim, is exactly where is Eden in relationship to the world? Okay. Uh, some people say it's on top of Mount Hermon, and it's like a doorway you get there. or Because it sounds like... That's what I say. So the yeah. so Eden is synonymous with heaven, is synonymous with paradise. Okay. And there's some quibble about this, but it but th- this is the way that it's these these three wor- terms are are interwoven everywhere all the time. All the time. Eden, paradise, and heaven. 
and, and, and also I'll throw another one in there, the father's house, the father's house. So the father's house is Eden, is heaven, is paradise. Well, Tim, what about the physical markers in the Bible? It talks about the Euphrates and the headwaters. Well, I talk and- about that in my book. I actually go into great length to, dis- to, to explain what that means. And it's, it's very symbolic because you have the confluence, you have the confluence of rivers. And in the Mesopotamian iconography, the confluence, and not just Mesopotamian iconography all over the world, actually, you have the confluence of rivers, which represents what's what's called a an axis mundi. The waters again. And uh, this is it gets complicated, but an axis mundi is basically every almost every major culture on earth has some kind of representation of an axis mundi. It's usually in the form of a tree, of a world tree, but there's other forms, depictions of an axis mundi that are variegated throughout the different cultures. But basically what it describes is a gateway that connects the different worlds together, the different realms together. I liken it in my book to the wood between the worlds for those who are familiar with uh, C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. This is specifically the magician's nephew, the first, not the first installment of the Chronicles of Narnia, but in the chronology, it's the, it's the first story in, the, in chronological Well, order. that's kind of why I asked the, the question about the waters earlier, because it seems like there's something in the water. Well, it's the water. Specifically. Wa- it's the, don't, don't take it literally. It's, it is, it is, it's a, um, <laughs> it's a, um, I cannot ever remember that this It makes word. the gr- giants grow tall. No. Is that from Lord of the Rings? <laughs> something in the water. Well, it's a, um, um, I'm trying to think of the word. It's an analogy. That's the word. I want. Yeah. Or it's an analogy. It's an analogy of, of something. It's symbolic of something. And, um, I, and I go through this again in the book, I go into great detail about all of this, but, but I do not believe that Eden, that the garden of Eden, that the tree of life was ever on planet earth. There's, Many reasons I think that, and it would take a long time to explain them, but but very quickly, just a cursory examination of this idea, you, you talk about the tree of life, for example, there's nowhere in the Bible that where we read that the tree of life was taken off of the earth. So Adam and Eve were banished from the garden, the gates were closed. And the cherubim were placed at the gate, but I don't think that I don't think the cherubim were placed at the gate for to keep Adam and Eve out. By the way, I don't I don't think Adam and Eve could perceive the gate after the fall. I think the gate the cherubim were placed at the gate to keep somebody else out who was in the garden before the fall or had access to it for a very specific reason. If, if I put this in practical terms, heaven and earth almost met each other. Well, they were connected through the axis through an axis mundi through a, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's another way of saying stargate. So I believe that the gate, I believe that the gate to Eden was on earth. The gate to Eden was on earth. And that is what Mm. was shut. If you think of Eden as the father's Mm. house, it all makes sense. So when Jesus in the book of Revelation, Jesus says that for those who overcome, he will give them the right to eat from the tree of life, which is where? Eden. The paradise of his father. Okay. So this is confusing though. So Satan is trapped on earth before Adam is created. And then he has access to Eden after? Apparently. And that, that is a very interesting situation. It's a very paradoxical situation, which, I, again, I talk about in the book. I go into great detail talking about that in the book. These are all very complex topics. Yeah. They're not, there's no simple answer to anything. Mm-hmm. There just isn't. It's very complex. Um, so if the, if the gate to Eden was on earth, then we have to, and, and if that character who was in Eden, this, namely the serpent, is in fact the devil, Satan, who, which, which I think we, we should agree that he is because John tells us that he is. That serpent of old, John says, who is the devil and Satan. And that serpent of old is obviously an allusion to the serpent in the garden. And again, let's dispel the notion right off the bat, which I think your audience is probably already uh, has already disabused themselves of, of this idea that that this was a snake. This wasn't a snake. It wasn't a talking snake. It wasn't some kind of a lizard. And it wasn't a reptilian. This was a very handsome man. Man about 30, well, he would appear to us about 30 years old, probably very tall, blonde hair, blue eyes, very, very attractive man. He's, he's cunning. Um, he operates by stealth. And by deception, and that's that how we would think of the, that as the attributes of a, of a serpent, of a snake. That's how a snake operates. That's how a snake hunts. That's what a snake is known for. And so that's how we would describe us 
earth beings who live on the earth, who are no longer in communion mm. with these other entities because we've been severed from the family. So, we would we have to describe these things in earthly terms and, and using the natural world around us, using the animal kingdom. And so, how are we going to describe this being? We're going to describe him like a serpent or like a lion who goes around roaring like a lion, hungry, um, who looking to devour something or somebody is also a way. To, and by the way, Christ is also described with those two. Yeah. Um, Lion of those two aspects of, the, of those yeah. animals. He's, he's, he's the serpent that's raised in the desert, that Moses raised in the desert. He's the bronze serpent. That's Christ. And he's also just given the attributes of a lion in the scriptures, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Um, and so, Luke's got a tattooed on him. So, so in the same way that we don't think of Christ as, a li- as an actual lion or a lion man or something, or a lamb or some kind of a chimeric lion lamb man thing, or as a serpent, in the same way, we shouldn't think of uh, this character in the garden as a, as a snake or even serpentine, even even serpentine. In other words, in other words, in my opinion, very strong opinion, the devil is in no way uh, he, he does not have the appearance of a serpent. He is not a reptilian. He is not a grotesque being. He looks like us. And so that's why you can imagine now. I want you to imagine now the scenario of the garden. And Eve conversing not with a snake, not with a reptilian, but with someone who kind of looks like Adam, but probably more magnificent, not probably, definitely more magnificent than Adam. And somebody who's been around for a very long time, who has knowledge that both Adam and Eve would like to know things about the past, just like we would be curious if we were talking to extraterrestrials that have existed, let's say, 100,000 years before we did, we would have all kinds of questions and we would, we would want to know things. And I don't think Adam and Eve were just talking to the bad guy. I think they were, in, in, they were conversing with the good guys as well. And God permitted the bad guy to be in Eden. I have a question before we get to this to that transaction if adam changed once he ate from the tree of good and evil why couldn't the earth have changed once sin entered into it because it doesn't make sense to me that that eden was in a different place than the actual the earth the crust the the creation itself how come the earth itself couldn't have changed with the sin entering it does make it actually it it, it's the only way it makes sense we there's a prevailing misconception that we we all suffer from I certainly did for a long time. It took me a lot of contemplation to break out of it because it didn't make any sense, and it bothered me for a long time. And that is that there was no entropy in the world before the sin of Adam. And what I mean by entropy is things were not corroding, things were not breaking down, things were not wearing away, suffering death before yeah. the sin of Adam. But that, that that's just that's simply not a biblical concept. The biblical concept is specifically that there was no death in the human race before Adam. Anything other than that is nonsensical. If we are to presume that the, there was no death in nature before the sin of Adam, then we have to imagine Adam and Eve romping around the woods, uh, trotting underfoot, um, caterpillars and different creatures, but those creatures not dying. They didn't squish and die. Let's say Adam walking around steps on a caterpillar, that there's some sort of a force field around that caterpillar and that Adam's foot rebounds when he steps on it and that nothing is subject to death. That's simply not the case. It's not, in fact, it's not what the Bible says. That the Bible says that the suffering was would be increased, that the that the that the futility would be increased, that the, that women would be subject to more pain in childbearing. Hmm. So it wasn't as if these things didn't exist. It's that they were increased. The earth would become more futile. It would not give its bounty so freely. It would take the sweat of the brow now that it would also bring forth thorns and thistles. So the earth was in a much more pristine condition. The, the soil was much more fertile. The, the earth was not subject to the same degree of futility that it is now. We have to we have to work harder to extract the bounties of the earth, the the uh, substances of the earth to to, the, to sustain ourselves, the sustenance of the earth. That's why the sweat of the brow, by the sweat of the brow, um, uh, is part of the curse of Adam. So 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 let me f- finish this thought so I can complete the circle here. So 
the question, the, these are very deep theological questions that most people just simply do not contemplate that it took me a long time before I began to contemplate them because I took mm-hmm. a lot of things for granted. Um, so, the, the, the mechanism, the, the universe that we have existent in the, in today that we're all subject to, the, the laws of physics, including essential, one of the central laws, the law of thermodynamics and, and entropy, were built into the system from the beginning when it was created. These are not, the entropy is not a force that came into existence with the fall of Adam. It is a force that existed in the world, but to which Adam himself was not subject until the fall. Now, there's the difference. So, entropy existed, and again, entropy is the the tendency to corrode, the tendency to decay and to degenerate that is apparent not only on the earth, but in the universe. So, it's like a clock, right? It's wound up, it's ticking, and it, and it's going to reach its terminus at some point. It's going to wind down and is, in fact, winding down. All of nature, not just human beings, not just biological things, inanimate things and biological things, all things, life and rocks and everything is, is undergoing this process of entropy. Invariably, this is just a fact of nature. And we are now subject to entropy. So, I'm going to ask you, and of course, we weren't planning on talking about this, but, but uh, it doesn't matter because I, I, actually, I actually like this conversation because it's territory that most people don't tread when they think about this story, the story of Adam and Eve, because we take for granted the Sunday school. Mm, I don't want to be harsh. I don't want to be mean, but the Sunday school indoctrination that we receive, that is very coloring book. And so, we're sort of, we're sort of delving deeper here into questions that are paramount to understanding the context of what's going on when Adam was created. And really, there's no, there's no way to avoid it at this point, so we might as well just dive further in. I asked a question <laughs> in my book, and I'm trying to find it here. Um, and we're talking about water, so we can dive in, right, Luke? <laughs> I do actually talk about the cosmic waters a lot in my book, well, on the I summit mean- of Mount Hermon. Well, the, the thing about all this, Tim, is it, may, it sounds like a hybrid. It sounds like Eden is a hybrid of heaven and earth. And we talk about hybrids on the show, and that's just what more my mind is. Well, Eden is the Father's house. Eden is the Father's house. Eden is paradise, is heaven, is... But isn't paradise a, a waiting place for heaven? Well, they're getting into a different conversation there. Yeah, that's a complete. That, you're talking about Abraham's <laughs> bosom. Um, well, and the answer to the short answer to that is no, because the tree of life is in paradise. Jesus tells us in Revelation. So ultimately, okay. paradise is our okay. destination. Why is paradise our destination? Because it's the Father's house. But we're never going to leave the earth. Our home is planet Earth, period. End of story. Our home is planet Earth. We were created as the regents of the Earth. Now, does that mean that we're not going to leave the Earth and go elsewhere on excursions and expeditions and so forth? No, absolutely not. But it just means that our home base, where we have been given authority, is planet Earth. And, and, but the, the Father's house is not planet Earth. The Father's house is elsewhere. And remember the parable of the prodigal son. The prodigal son was where? He was in the father's house from the beginning. He was part of the royal family, but he was was dispatched to govern the earth. And he had access to the father's house through the gate of Eden. So, if you start to think of it in terms of a regent who's dispatched to govern the earth, but has access back to the father's house to commune with the father, I believe Adam was a member of the council. That's just my personal belief. There isn't a whole lot of weight. There isn't a whole lot of uh, uh, textual verification for that, but there's some. You see it in my book if you read. But I think Adam was a part of the council, uh, and, we're in, and Adam had access to this. He was created to be a son of God in the family, endowed with all of the benefits of his estate as a son of God, which means he, was, he had access to the Father's house. Remember, Jesus says, in my Father's house are many rooms or many mansions, depending on your version that you're reading. And I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And so, where's he going to prepare this place? He's going to his father's house to prepare a place for us so that he might come and get us and bring us to where he is in the father's house. And the father's house is not here. It's not here. Hmm. So, if we concede that Eden was the father's house, was paradise, and that paradise is the father's house, then then we have to also conclude that the Father's house was not, is not on earth, and that Eden, therefore, was not on earth. But the gate to Eden was here and is here, 
but it's shut right now because we've we've lost we've been divorced from the family and because we've been expelled like like the prodigal son who made the choice just like Adam and Eve made the choice to relinquish their inheritance to squander is really the right term to squander their inheritance and become subject to the swine herd and here's the it, this is <laughs> very complicated because we become subject to the swine herd who is the devil through sin and so there's a degree of there's an exchange here that happens through sin that we allow ourselves to become subjugated to the influence of the apostate sons of God by becoming like them, by sinning, by subjecting ourselves to will, willfully subjecting ourselves to their influence. Um, and I'll stop talking here for a while. So I have a couple questions here. Like, so first, do you think that Adam and Eve could freely? use this gate to come to from the garden the to yes. the earth because I mean, because that makes sense, right? Because when Cain's ejected from the garden, he obviously comes he is earth and they have these cities and the cities pop up around Mount Hermon and, you know, and then you have them ejected. So there had to be some sort of traveling back and forth. Well, the gates to Eden were closed. So Adam and Eve, man. Well, when they, when they get ejected, yes. Right. Well, here's but the like thing. previous here, to that, here's the wondrous thing about our story. Mankind was created to be a part of the family, to have access to the father's house, to commune with the father, to commune with the other. But also could be on earth at the same time. Yes, but he was charged, mandated with the governance of earth. And that mandate was not one of gardening. Adam's mandate was not just to uh, to take a rake and till the earth. That was not the mandate of mankind. The mandate of mankind is expressed in the Lord's Prayer. Jesus expresses the mandate of mankind. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the mandate of mankind, to execute the will of God on planet earth, to be the vice regents of the king governing the earth as we as we multiply, as we fill the earth and multiply and nations arise. We were supposed to govern according to the precepts of the kingdom of heaven and to be good and faithful regents of the king on earth, to steward the earth, to steward the the earth and all of its biodiversity, to be good stewards of the earth, to cause the earth to flourish as much as we can, to reduce suffering as much as we can, and to be a civilization that honors God and that is that is faithful to the king and to his kingdom. That's what we were supposed to be. We weren't supposed to be glorified gardeners. That's not what the story is, is about. So Adam, in order to complete this function, yes, Adam was a region to earth, but he had access to the household of his father, where he would commune with his father and where he would be probably sit on the council with his others, with the other siblings, and then go back to his domain and execute the will of God. That's what the, what I'm trying to convey. Okay. So let's use the father's house analogy. Before we had access to the upstairs and the downstairs, the basement is earth. The top of the house is heaven. And then when we sinned, we were then trapped in the basement. We couldn't get back. We couldn't go back through the door. We were kind of stuck in the bottom part of it. So does earth change at that moment, you think? Yes, earth does change. Is that a good analogy or is that not a... It is. It is actually, that's the way that the ancient Hebrews thought about it. They had a, they had this three-tiered cosmology. There was, and every, almost every ancient culture has a three-tiered cosmology. The Inca certainly did in many, many different cultures. You have you have the abode of the gods, which is the sort of the upper world, the, the heavens. You have the abode of mankind and of the biological life on earth, which was this middle realm, Midgard. I think a lot of us are familiar with now because of the Thor movies. And then you have the underworld, the underworld, which which is depicted almost universally the same, represented by a serpent usually. Um, for example, the Inca represented the heavenly realm with the condor because the condor flies in the heavens, it, the earthly realm. That was the Hanan Pacha, the earthly realm, which was the Kai Pacha, was represented with the puma because it, it prowls around the earth and in the jungles. And then you have the Uru Pacha, which was the underworld represented by the snake, by the serpent. So this is almost universal. And then certainly, certainly you have this representation in the Hebrew cosmology as well, the, the greater Mesopotamian cosmology. 
And so that is essentially the world tree. That's the axis mundi. That's, that's the idea of all the realms are connected. Although the reality is that there's more than just these realms. There's a multiplicity of realms in the kingdom of heaven and not just three. So mankind was given dominion of this one, of this realm. And by the way, there are other realms in the universe that our elder siblings have dominion of, are the regents of. And I talk extensively about that. So in the book, this is, it's a much broader view of things. It's a much more complex. And I would even say, I would even, and I would even venture to say a much more mature way to view what's going on because it makes a lot more sense to us. Maybe it didn't make Maybe maybe the, the more simplistic way of these things being explained through, through symbology uh, and analogy and metaphor made more sense to the ancients because that's the way they talked. I mean, I mean, this is the way that the ancients described everything was in these terms of animals and things because they didn't have the kind of understanding and not to, not to belittle them in any way, but they didn't understand the nature of the world that, in the way that we do. We have a much more scientific understanding, so we can now begin to upgrade the way that we think about these things. And I think come to a much more accurate understanding of the way the universe works and specifically the kingdom of heaven, the way the kingdom of heaven is arranged and the way things work. It gets complicated because it sounds like in some biblical stories, like Satan can go talk to God. Well, I want you to remember, uh, recall how the watchers arrived to the earth. Where did they come? Where did they arrive? Mount Hermon. Stargate on top of Mount Hermon. Exactly. From where? From whence (laughs) did they come? They came from heaven. From heaven. That's right. From the kingdom of God. They, so the watchers were not bad guys until they committed an act of sedition. And before they committed the act of sedition, they were in the kingdom of heaven, perhaps even in the father's house. And I would, I would venture to say they were in the father's house. And they committed this act of sedition, and they come to the earth through a gate. And they're stuck here. On Hermon, which is where I believe the gate to paradise is. In some way, in some fashion. Yeah, which, we've talked which, about that. Okay, so so if the if they came from the Father's house, from from paradise, from the kingdom of heaven, the capital, let's say, of the kingdom of heaven, and they arrived to the earth on the on the summit of Hermon, then why is it so difficult for us to think in those terms when we think about Eden and Adam and Adam going to that place through the gate and then coming back through the same gate? Now that it sounds like he has two properties, it's not as hard to, to understand if he has two He's a son in the father's house who's been given the regency of planet Earth. Okay, so how can Satan go talk to God when he's tempting Job? Because he was permitted to. The devil doesn't do anything that he's not permitted to do. He's not permitted to do things. And, and by the way, when I say not permitted, I mean by force. By force, the devil is outnumbered. He's not all powerful. He's completely outnumbered. He's he's a controlled opposition. If you hear anything I'm saying, and I hear this, Satan is controlled opposition. He, he, He doesn't just act and do whatever he wants. He's very constrained in what he can do. The agents of the kingdom of heaven, the non human agents of the kingdom of heaven, keep him in check. And he's only allowed to do what he's been permitted to do. And he cannot go beyond his bounds because if he does, then other guys are going to show up and put him back in place. That's just how it works. It's, it's force. But he can go through this Stargate. He was permitted at least at, at, at a time, I think, when Adam was created. And, and, and we don't have to get deep into that. But Yeah. So he's orig- just to recap, he's originally stuck before the Incarcerated before the was, after yeah. the insurrection, incarcerated for who knows how long, by the way. Adam's created. Adam's created a new regent. There's a new sheriff in town. Adam is given dominion of the earth. And the devil and his angels are now subject to Adam's dominion on earth. We are not subject to Satan's dominion. He is subject to ours. And by the way, by the way, that does not, I, I do not mean to say that that the earth is only under the dominion of Christians. That's not the case. It is under the dominion of Adam and his offspring. That who that is so the human race collectively, good, bad, or indifferent. Yeah, and we talked about that extensively when we talked about how the Nephilim kings got power because they were part human. Yeah. Exactly right. That's exactly why they did that. So, yeah. so, so the devil is subject to our authority. And, and again, I'm not talking about our authority in Christ. I'm, a talking, I'm talking about our authority in Adam. And our authority in Adam is the original mandate 
the original birthright. That's why my book's called Birthright. It's the birthright of the human species is dominion of the earth, period. And the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. So now Satan, can can he still come and go through this? So now, no, I don't think, I think the answer to that is no. So so now let's, now we can talk about for a moment, we can begin to contemplate this the, the question. Actually, I'd like to circle back for a moment. <laughs> and because I know that people, I dropped some 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 bombs in people's brains right now, and I know that there are some. Go back and listen. Go back and listen. Probably a thousand questions circulating, and one of those questions I mentioned that I do not believe that the Earth became subject to entropy at the fall. I believe that the Earth, indeed the universe, was always subject to entropy. It is a mechanism built into the design from the beginning. It's winding down, and that's why it's going to be renewed at the end. There's going to be a renewal of all things, and who knows? Maybe the next time around, entropy will not be a part of the system, but it is now. And so then we have to contemplate the question. I don't want to leave this hanging out there. I want to answer this question before we move on because it's just lingering out there. I can I can d- discern it. So that brings up the question of Adam. So if the earth was subject to death, then, then how could Adam be functioning on the earth and not also be subject to entropy? This is an important concept because this is going to bring up some future conversations with us that you may find very intriguing. There are two kinds of immortality that we have to deal with before we get further into the story. There are two, and I don't know if I've talked about this and, and, and stop me if I have, there are two kinds of immortality. Yeah, we've talked about it. Intrinsic and ex- there's yeah, intrinsic and extrinsic. It. So if we understand that mankind was not intrinsically immortal, in fact, nothing is intrinsically immortal except for God. Everything is extrinsically immortal and therefore contingent. The, their import, immortality is contingent on the gift of God, whatever that is, whether it's some kind of fruit from a tree or whether it's some kind of a rejuvenating substance or atmosphere, or whatever that's in the paradise of God that allows us to rejuvenate and is a gift of immortality. And therefore, we have immortality because we have access to this thing, whatever it is, this thing that if we are cut off of that from access to it, which is in the paradise of God, then we are subject to the entropy at work in the universe and we will die and we will decay and we will degenerate. We are now subject to the mechanism which we were no lo- we were not subject to in the beginning. So the question is. Yeah, the wages of sin is death. It's not the wages of sin, I'm going to kill you. It's the wages of sin is you will die. And why is that the case? Because you have been cut off from paradise. The gate is closed and you are outside of it. Therefore, you are now subject to entropy because you no longer have access to the tree of life and that rejuvenating force. So therefore, the primordial condition of Adam's extrinsic immortality allows us to answer two contradictory questions in the affirmative. I write, was man designed to die? Yes. Was man intended to live forever? 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 Yes. Uh, both of those questions are true. We were designed as part of the universe, as part of creation. We were designed to be subject to entropy, but we were given the gift of eternal life mm, from God mm. so that we would not be subject to entropy. However, it was contingent, contingent on our faithfulness to God. And once we were no longer faithful, we became insurgent. We became seditious and unfaithful. The door to paradise was closed. We were the, now the prodigal son. We're on the other side of paradise, and we have no longer have access to the tree of life. Hence, we are subject to entropy, the same entropy that has always existed in the universe. And then on top of that, we have a curse that there will now be an increase in fu- the futility of the soil. There will be an increase in pain, an increase of suffering, hmm. an increase in 
the difficulties uh, presented to us by nature and an increase probably in the pestilence and in death and in all of the other things that go along with that. Okay. So it's almost like we were, we were dual citizens. We had dual citizenship of heaven and earth. Well, we, right? we, well, well, we were citizens of the kingdom. We were more than citizens. We were regents. We were sons in the family of God. But I mean, yeah, in practical terms. And then we lost to the earth to govern here. We in fact, were created from the soil of the earth, created from the very realm we were created to govern, specifically yeah. created to govern this planet, made from the soil of this planet to govern this place and, and to be caretakers of the earth. And, but we had access to the Father's house. We were sons. So that door was open. When the fellowship was broken, the door was shut. And so when that happened, the, here, now we come to the question. We had supreme authority on earth as regents of the king. Obviously, we're always subjected to the king. God reserves the right. The king of heaven reserves the right to interfere in the affairs of men, to intervene in the affairs of men whenever he wants. He's the ultimate supreme authority. But on earth, he's given us authority. Now, people are going to say, um, and I'm sure have already been saying in their minds, but that's not what the Bible teaches. Well, it is, in fact, exactly what the Bible teaches. The Bible says explicitly in the Psalms that the heavens, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. It does not say, but the earth he has given to the devil. It doesn't say that. He, the, but the earth he has given to the fallen angels. It doesn't say that. The earth. Okay, so we we can't go back and forth anymore. We're stuck here. We're stuck here on earth. We can't get to the Father's house. Yes, earth changes. Now we can get to, to Mars, <laughs> but we can't get to the Father's house. Which is just a whole nother so conversation. So your question then, can the devil get to the Father's house? Yeah, the answer is yeah. no, because after Eden, the gates were closed and cherubim were placed there. Why were the cherubim placed there, by the way? And when you say cherubim, what we're talking about is members of the elder race who are guarding the way to the gate. Why are they there? They're not there to stop us. We can't even perceive the way anymore. They're there to stop the other guys from gaining access. The door is shut. The devil's not allowed in anymore. And, and even if they tried to force their way in, they're not going to be successful. Because but he can communicate with God still somehow. I don't know. What about what about Job? What about Job one? What about Job one ten? Where and Job one six? Where he's got a radio. Well, we don't know what the this is a this is a this is a, this is a different topic altogether. <laughs> we don't know exactly who that person is. Number one, I mean, we say it's the, the, the Satan. The Satan isn't always the only Satan that we're talking about in the scriptures. There are satans. There's right, a it, means, it means adversary, adversaries, accuser, right? Uh, yeah. uh, uh, yes, adversaries. Not even necessarily bad guy. Not even necessarily bad guys in every com- context. So that's not that. That's a whole different discussion. So we don't need to assume that. Now that we're going to get the emails. Now we're going to get yelled at. Well, this is something that <laughs> I think people are familiar with. Um, uh, who've, who've yeah, yeah. delved into the into the ancient. Uh, the Hebrew perception of things, you're going to find this very quickly. There's not just one Satan. There are Satans and, and there are adversaries and there are people who are sent to test and to tempt and so forth. So, so someone was communicating. Someone had access then. Still. Well, or we're just, or we're just, yeah. Or, or we're just emissaries who, who were sent out to see what's going on and come back and report back to God. But I don't think we make an assumption that that was the dragon. There's a whole nother line of thought there. That's very interesting. But but let's let's get back to this issue of authorities. The dominion of Satan, right? Because I, I think what I think about, Tim, and what I want to understand is we established our the Adamic dominion here, right? And we've been shut out of, of Eden, and Satan's been released by virtue of the very least of the earth being made or renewed or, you know, the waters of the deep, the spirit of God, the Lord hovered the waters of the deep. And then he created, he created these things, right? So this happens. Satan is now no longer imprisoned. He says he, he roams the earth like a, like a roaring lion. And then, then we get into things where I think this is where the, the fallacies happen. It, you know, we get into Luke, right? Luke four, where the temptation of Christ. And I think this is what I always think about when we talk about does Satan have dominion is that Christ is tempted. He's fasted for 40 days. I'll paraphrase, paraphrase it, but the devil takes him to a high place and shows him the kings of the world and says, I will give you their authority and splendor. It's been given to me and I'll give it to anyone I want to if you worship me to be yours. And of course, Jesus shuts him down. But that, I think, is, is where people start saying, well, all this is, and he has dominion here. This is all his stuff, right? This is not, and yet the birthright in the Adamic 
our, our Adamic sort of the, that deed to this planet as it maybe is the easiest way to put it belongs to us though. So where, where does the, where's the rub then with the temptation of Christ and, and then our own birthright. And maybe that's, uh, is that, is that the next step? Um, that, well, that's a, the, a very good question. So this is uh, this is the crux of the issue. We know that Christ was tempted by the devil. And um, let me, uh, so this is the crux of the issue. What, what is the devil's functional authority on earth? What is his pragmatic, his practical authority on earth? Does he have authority on earth is the first question. The answer is clearly yes. He does have a degree of authority on earth. He has been authorized to do certain things on earth and is not authorized to do other things. Um, and this is, this is clearly the case as we take two things into account, as we first take the scriptures into account, and then second, take human history into account. We have 5,000 years of recorded human history behind us in the rearview mirror. So we can make certain assertions with great confidence because we understand how human history has, has unwind over the centuries, uh, has occurred. And we're very much aware of the way things work in human society. So again, we go back to the very initial question of this conversation. How does the devil operate? How does he influence? How does he operate and manipulate or interact with human society? What is the mechanism of his interaction? Uh, most of us presume that the devil rules the earth from his hellish domain like Sauron from Mordor, that he's this, this grotesque being sitting on this throne, controlling everything like the great eye in the, in the Lord of the Rings there from the, from, the, from the tower, and that he's watching everything and controlling everything and moving all the pieces on the board and directly controlling his minions, his human minions, that they're somehow in direct contact with him or contact in, with demons, that demons are in contact with the devil, and then they convey their messages to his message to mankind. And this is sort of the way we think about it. And the reason why we think about it this way is because this is the way that the, that the medieval Catholic Church has taught us to think about it through the paintings and the depictions and the frescoes and, the, and, and, and just the, the medieval uh, conceptualization of the way that uh, of the devil and, and the way that the kingdom of darkness operates. But I will submit to you that this is not an accurate depiction of the kingdom of, as the Bible calls the, the kingdom of darkness. In fact, the devil is very constrained. His authority is very limited. And he accrues authority on earth through us. We abdicate authority to him. And the mechanism by which we abdicate authority to the devil, and it's our authority that we abdicate to him. We give him authority. How do we give it to him? There's a very specific term that is the primary mechanism through which the devil accrues human authority on earth. And that word is idolatry. And that's why idolatry was so forbidden and was such an abomination, because it is through idolatry that the devil and his minions and his angels are able to accrue authority, human authority on earth, and have more influence into human affairs. Otherwise, he would have none except for being able to tempt us. He is authorized to tempt, the Bible tells us. Is he authorized to kill? Not in Job, he's not. Well, didn't let's, he have to? Uh, let's assuming that that was the devil, which I'm, I don't believe that it was. But let's let's play mm. with this thought for a moment. Even if that was the devil, right? The guy, the dragon, who got permission to to torment Job. The fact is, he still had to get authorization to do it. I don't think he can, right. no, because otherwise we'd all be dead. If he was exactly, exactly right, we have to think pragmatically. We can't think religiously. We can't think, we can't think superstitiously and we can't think supernaturally because none of that has any explanatory power. We have to think, we have to think in terms of reality. Yeah, because he gets King, he gets King Herod to kill all the, the, the first. Exactly. He tempts him to do it. So yeah. the devil is allowed to tempt all day long. He is allowed to tempt all day long. He is authorized to tempt. We know that, but he's authorized to do more than just tempt when he gains influence through idolatry. When he gains influence through idolatry, he accrues a degree of our authority 
And now we have more of a direct influence over the affairs of mankind. Never is he authorized to occupy a human throne. Believe me, if he could, he would. Let's remember, what is the devil's primary desire? Not objective, because if his objective has to do with what I call the dragon slayer prophecy to avoid his fate. What is his primary desire? We are told what it is. It is to be worshipped, extolled, not secretly extolled, not just extolled by some faction of Luciferians or, or Satanists having a meeting in some barn, you know, in rural America somewhere. No, he wants to be openly, publicly worshipped and adored uh, and acknowledged as uh, this wonderful, powerful being. He doesn't want to operate by stealth. He has to. It's the rules of the game. But if he could, he would reveal himself to everybody and receive the adulation that would surely follow. He is simply not permitted to do that. He will do it at the end of the age because the beast, who I believe will be his hybrid offspring, is going to direct the adulation to the dragon. To the dragon. Man. Through us. And this is what I call proximal authority. Well, this is proxy. the modus operandi yep. of the kingdom of darkness. Their authority is accrued through our abdication, through the abdication of human authority. Now, having said that, this is what I call rule by proxy. And um, so the and Romans me, did, Tim. So the Romans did. This is like the Roman Empire, right? Let yeah. me directly answer your question regarding Christ. And I'm going to just read this quote from my book. This rule by proxy modus operandi is manifest in the temptations of Christ. By the time Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth was born at the turn of the first century, the whole world was enthralled to the influence of Satan, the influence of Satan, knowing full well that this son of man, born of a virgin, according to the dragon slayer prophecy, was destined to rule the nations, the old serpent attempted to beguile him with a cunning proposition. And the devil took him up and showed him, and this is Luke 4, and the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, to you, I will give you all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. Note that the authority over the kingdoms had been delivered to the devil. Nowhere in the biblical narrative is he, is he granted such an endowment by God. Instead, he had gradually accumulated his authority through the willful abdication of human kings. It is a matter of history and no coincidence that the first and greatest Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus, reigned at the time of Christ's birth, Octavian. All the power of the Roman Empire, which governed the known world, was invested in its emperors who claimed to have received their divine authority from Jupiter, king of the gods and patron of the Roman state, in whose image they were often portrayed. In other words, the Roman Caesars are often portrayed in the image of Jupiter. This is just a historical fact. You can find busts of the uh, or statues of the emperors posed as Jupiter. Why? Because they were saying that they had been invested with their authority from their father, Jupiter. Jupiter, or Jove, was the Roman adaptation of Zeus, whom Jesus, in his, admi in his admonition to the church of Pergamon, identifies as Satan. Pergamon was home to the famed altar of Zeus, which was no doubt smoldering with burnt offerings at the very moment John penned the Lord's words, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, in Revelation, where John is writing to the church in Pergamon. So, um, and I'll just continue this, and this'll, this'll, and, then, and then I'll take your question. Satan's throne as the altar of Zeus is a fitting portrait of his rule by proxy. Like the Roman emperors, Greek kings, Greek kings were believed to receive their authority from Zeus and governed as his representatives. A brazen adulteration of Adam's original mandate to represent the true king of the gods on earth. By worshiping Zeus and Jupiter, the Greeks and the Romans were willfully bowing their knees to Yahweh's arch enemy, who made a lurid show of triumph through his proxies 
on two separate occasions. And here I cite Greek Antiochus Epiphanes, who regarded himself as a manifestation of Zeus and erected a statue of Zeus in the temple of Yahweh. And then I talk about the emperor Hadrian, who raised a temple to Jupiter over the desecrated remains of Yahweh's temple, which was sacked in 70 AD. And indeed, he, the these were lurid representations, statements really by the devil that he would be the god of this world. Now, in both of those cases, the, the, the Greeks through Antiochus Epiphanes and through the Roman emperor Hadrian, the devil was working through these kings, through these human kings. He was not controlling them like a puppet. They're not on strings. He's, and, and, he wasn't, and he wasn't possessing them. They weren't be, being possessed by demons and controlled, you know, like remote controlled by demons or something like that. These were human kings who had already bowed their knees to Satan in the guise of Zeus and Jupiter, who had already abdicated their authority to Zeus and Jupiter, who claimed to be given authority by Zeus and Jupiter, when indeed it was the other way around. Hmm. And so these are human proxies. And proxies are, let's say that to some degree, a coach coaching a football team and telling them what plays to run, the team is the coach's proxy. The, the, the coach is, is manipulating the plays through his proxies, which are the players on the field. In that sense, that's the same way that human beings are manipulated and tempted and are become tools in the devil's hands, pawns on the board, so to speak. That's the, that's the rule by proxy modus operandi, which is clearly manifest in the scriptures. And so, returning to Christ, Christ is tempted by Satan. Satan shows him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. What was Satan showing, Satan showing Christ in the first century and all their glory? What was he showing Christ in the first century? The Roman Empire. Yeah, yeah. And whose statue was sitting in the, 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 in the, in the, uh, Zeus. In, in the, in the central of Rome, in the center of Rome as the patron god of the Roman Empire, Jupiter, Zeus, who was an aspect of Satan. And so mankind had abdicated their authority to Satan and given him a direct influence in the realm, so direct, so powerful that he could manipulate, that the minds of men were manipulated were, and they were completely under the influ influence, not the direct control, the influence of the devil. What if, Tim, let's think, let's think very practical here. I like all this. What would <laughs> it reminds me of some movie scenes? How come human kings couldn't literally go to some sort of secret G twenty meeting and, and meet Satan himself and meet with the devil himself? Because direct Do you think that happens? contact is prohibited. Okay, can't have direct contact. Well, direct contact is always prohibited. If direct contact weren't prohibited, then it would be very easy for the devil and his angels to just start appearing to all kinds of people. I mean, it just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. And I mean, I don't mean just appearing, you know, uh, momentarily or something. I'm talking about holding court somewhere. But he, uh, but he appears holding to court, Jesus. Let's say, let's say holding court in Antarctica, right? And that's where all these, all these world leaders are going to hold court with Satan. That would be akin to Satan setting up a throne. That would, in fact, that would be exactly this. Satan setting up a throne on earth and having the kings of the earth come and pay obeisance to him. Mm -hmm. That is that does not happen. It is yeah. not happening. Now, pay obeisance to him in their own way, abdicate their own authority, set up their own altars to Satan, pledge fealty to him in their own way, do human sacrifices. All of that happens. But the devil is not permitted to govern the nations. Why? Yeah. Because yeah. that authority has been given to us and only to us. When David is lamenting in the Psalms, like, God, rise up, reclaim the nations that were supposedly given to the sons of God at the Tower of Babel incident, and a lot of guys that come on our show preach the Deuteronomy 32 worldview, that there was a time when these lesser Elohim uh, entities were governing these areas. Never. Never. Well, oh, how can I say that so confidently? Perhaps some might think so arrogantly, because I have the history, 5,000 years of history in the rearview mirror. Tell me a time when any of these gods were the kings or emperors of any nation. No, the progeny were, right? If we talk about... Well, now you're talking about the pre-flood world, and that's a whole different story. Okay. This yeah. is in the post-flood context. This is Babel. So tell me a time when any 
watcher or angel or anything other than a human being has occupied a human throne, has governed a nation. It's never happened. There was a time on earth when there was a hybrid kingdom, when there was an empire of the gods who ruled through their hybrid sons. Yes, that occurred. That's called the Genesis 6 affair. But in the post-flood context, there is not a time, there has never been a time when anything other than a human being has sat on a human throne and governed the nations of the earth ever. So to say that the nations were given over to these angels to be governed is not the correct paradigm. It's just not the correct paradigm. Now, am I saying that that worldview is false? No, I'm saying that there's there's an aspect of it that is true, but not in the way we think. So when God takes Israel specifically, what is okay, what's the difference between tell that? Tell me when God sat on the throne of David. Right. True. When did Yahweh sit on the throne and govern Israel? He didn't. By proxy. You know who sat on the throne? I'm going to tell you who sat on the throne. Saul sat on the throne. Saul wasn't even God's choice. Saul was the people's choice, remember? They wanted a king. Let's have a king over us, and they chose Saul. God didn't interfere. So can you believe in the 32 worldview via proxy? Yes. Okay. Yes, I can. Okay. Yes. Rule by proxy, yes. So, and that's what I'm saying. So we have this misconception. We think Assistant the, to the regional manager, right? <laughs> yeah, Dwight. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so so now, we're, now we're beginning to have a different understanding because when you talk about the nations are given over to the sons of God, well, what does that mean? Do men make the decisions or do the gods make the decisions? Let's not pass off our guilt, our bad governance, our sinful nature. Let's not... Let's not blame it on a fallen angel. We're, there's never been a time, as I said, when anything other than a human being has governed from a human throne. We are the only monsters who govern from human thrones and bring ruin to nations. We do. Human beings do. We are squarely responsible. Why? Because Adam and his offspring were given dominion of the earth. That dominion has never been rescinded, ever, ever. So what's been given... To, to the devil, to Satan, to, and to these sons of God, Elohim, is that they've been permission to influence. They're, and we give them the authority. They have permission to do influence, to tempt, right? To, to, to tempt, to try, be, attempt to influence. And they've been given that, but we give them the authority. We as human, they don't have any authority outside of what we give them. That's Luke 5 in a nutshell. And then the end of that, I think this is fascinating. Everything you've said is super scriptural. Luke 5 Luke 4, verse 5, is, I will give you authority and splendor, that which I've been given to me. I can give it to anyone I want to, if you worship me. And that's what you said initially. He wants to be worshipped. It's idolatry. And, and, so, and so do these. Idolatry. And so, so do his minions as well. They want to be worshipped, right? They want they to be. gain human authority yep. through idolatry. So this is, I mean, so our list for our listeners, yeah. Because whose authority is it to give? Tell me, whose authority is it to give? If I am a governor and I am a governor of Montana, I can delegate my authority to whomever I please. I can send somebody on my behalf. In fact, by the way, congressmen do this all the time. Instead of going and sitting in a session of Congress, sometimes senators and congressmen, they will send a delegate. Vote by proxy. That represents them. They've they've given, they've authorized this individual to sit in their chair, in their place, and, and to represent them. Hey, Tim, do you think that the story of the centurion sending his person to Jesus was sort of a metaphor of that? That was all about authority. Well, listen, to, look, here's, here's a great example. Tim, Pontius Pilate, right? I mean, this is from the story in the crucifixion of Christ. He acted as, uh, on the authority of the emperor, of the emperor in, Jer- in Jerusalem yeah. and passed judgment. Yeah. He is yeah. exactly authorized to do what he does by the emperor. In fact, right. appointed, appointed by the emperor to have authority in Judea. And so... If I, like, as I said, if I'm a governor, I can delegate my authority to whomever I will. And so, if I'm a human king, let's say in the ancient context, I'm a, I'm an, I'm, an, I'm a king. I'm a king of Ireland, and I have subjected all of the all of the Irish people to my dominion. I can delegate my authority. I can establish my authority through other people by delegating authority. If I then 
lead my people into idolatry and bring them into a, a posture of adulation and worship to some other being other than the king of heaven, because we're supposed to be worshiping God. And I, because God is the one who gave us the authority and only God is, is, and, and we're really only authorized to worship God. Anything else is an abomination. So if I lead my people to worship and extol an idol and some, like I erect a totem pole or something and, and we envision this God behind this totem pole and I'm then abdicating my authority, bowing my knee to someone else other than the creator, the maker, the king, then what I'm doing is I'm giving authority to that entity or to some entity to influence. I'm inviting them to come and influence my realm. In fact, I'm beseeching them to do this. Isn't this what, isn't this what the ancients did when they, made, when they sacrificed? Yeah. Isn't this what the ancients did? What were sacrifices if not direct appeals to the gods to come, help us, come, give us insight? What was that if not be directly beseeching the interference of these non-human entities into human affairs? We were giving them authority. We were asking them to come. We were authorizing them to come and have influence in our realm. And when we open that door and when we give that authority, then they are allowed, they are permitted then to come and operate in our realm in a way that they would otherwise not be authorized to do. But we gave them the authority. And when the devil says, I will give all this authority and their glory, when he says it to Christ, for it has been delivered to me, who delivered that authority to the devil? Who? Hmm, he, did. he did. God didn't. God did not give him that authority. We gave him the, the authority that he had over the nations. Jupiter was enthroned in Rome. Zeus was, was enthroned in Pergamon and throughout the ancient world. Jupiter, Zeus, he's the same guy. The world was under the spell of the devil. The, the, the atmosphere was completely infiltrated and saturated with demonic influence because we invited it. So if we flash forward from there, say we go from the Deuteronomy view and we're all doing idol worship, what happens, what does Christ do specifically to sort of cut off that authority? Does he... Does, does Christ's death do something? Like, obviously, you know, that, you know, you grow up in the church and they say it's all about your sin, and that's mostly what most people understand that happens when Christ is crucified. But it sounds like he is re- taking back authority, specifically in certain areas, or there are things that are happening behind the scenes that we just we can't understand when it comes to this topic specifically. Well, the, 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 the purpose of, of Christ was to bring the prodigal son back into the family of God. That was the primary purpose of Christ. Sure. And he came to be a sacrificial lamb. He did not come to take over the world. He came to, be, to, to redeem mankind. Now he's coming again to sit on the throne of David. And he has the authority to sit on the throne of David. Why? Because he's a human being. Mm-hmm. So he has, the, he has all authority in heaven as the son of God and all authority on earth as the son of God. Of man, but it seems like so, the world operates differently after Christ. It seems well, like the, the, yes, and that there is a yes because the world what became uh, the paganism that had gripped the known world at the time was broken in the in the aftermath of Christ's death and resurrection. That's just a matter of history that the the Roman Empire, which when we talk about the known world, we're talking about the Roman the Greco Roman world. The Roman Empire became ostensibly a Christian empire, which that in of itself is not entirely an accurate statement. But the paganism certainly subsided and Christianity, monotheism became the dominant religious framework in the West, in the Western world. Now, that's not the case. That wasn't the case in ancient China at the time. That wasn't the case in South America. When, when the church was growing in Asia Minor and when it, was, when it was expanding all over the known world, exactly at that time, the Inca were still worshiping Viracocha. In, in Central America, they were still worshiping Quetzalcoatl. 
in in North America, they were still worshiping the pagan gods and totem poles. And so paganism was not suddenly defeated in the world. The gods were not dethroned, unless we want to say that the the, the pagan gods were only dethroned in Europe and in Asia Minor and in the Mediterranean area. The, uh, I mean, that's all we could say. If we wanted to go use that line of thinking and say, well, see, Christ overthrew the pagan gods because the known world became Christian. Well, that's only the known world. And that's just a matter of history. And listen, when we think about these things, we need to start from reality and then reverse engineer from there. We need to back engineer from where we are, from the reality of known history and derive our understanding from what has actually occurred, not from, not from um, some kind of a, of a perception that, 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 that we have, rather from what has actually occurred. So when we look at what actually occurred in the aftermath of Christ's death and resurrection, what we see is a, what we see is the spread of the gospel throughout the known world. It would reach the shores of America, and it would reach into China and all over the world later on in history. But in the immediate aftermath, we see the, we see the rise uh, of the church, the spread of the gospel throughout the known world. And when, again, when I say the known world, we're talking about the Roman Empire. We see the gospel spreading through the Roman Empire, all, throughout the far reaches of the Roman Empire. That's what happened. And then we have the rise of of the Roman Catholic Church. Some people think that was a great thing. Other people think that wasn't such a great thing. I'm in the latter camp on that one. Although I will have to say that there are definitely major well, benefits to society that came through uh, the rise of the Roman Catholic Church, such as universities and scientific institutions yeah. and, and, and certain streams of philosophy and, and so forth. But there's well, a lot of negative things too. Well, I like I like this whole entire conversation because it it answers a lot of the complicated questions of why so much death and suffering, and why is history so complicated and messy? Well, because God uses humanity to accomplish because we have dominion and authority here. So, w my question is: is then why do the entities think that they need to kill Jesus? Because obviously, through occult practices of bloodshed and sacrifice, that's how they get their power. Why would they think to kill Jesus? Why would they think that that was, was the thing that they needed to do? I believe that they, they believe that he had come to, to sit on the throne of David oh. and to occupy the earth and to reign. That's certainly what the demons thought. They thought that the judge had appeared to judge the world, that their time, that, 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 that he had come prematurely because they said, why have you come before the appointed time? The demons would cry out. And that's why he told them to shut up. Because he, that was not the information he was there to convey anyway. Christ did not come to vanquish all of the evil in the world and occupy a throne. He came to redeem the sons, the lost sons of Adam. That's what he came to do. He came to redeem us, to, to purchase us for God through his blood. That's why he came. The devil, I don't believe, knew that that's exactly why he was there. I think the devil was under the impression that he had come to take over the nations. That's why he offered him the nations. I'll give them to you. You don't have to do get them in, in some difficult way or whatever. Who knows what the devil knew? But I'll give them to you. They're under my influence. I can direct their, I can, listen, Satan could not occupy, physically occupy the throne of the Caesar in Rome. Yeah. He couldn't do it. He wasn't authorized. He would do it but if he could, could, right? <laughs> guess who could? Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. could. Oh, Jesus man. could. And, and, the, and the whole Roman Empire was under the influence of Satan. He could have caused Jesus of Nazareth to rise through the ranks and be seated on the throne and then accomplish what he had in the devil's mind, perhaps what he had come to do to govern the nations, to sit on the throne, to root, to dash the nations to pieces with an iron, uh, like pottery with an iron rod, like the scriptures say. They think that he's trying to sit on the throne, that, 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 that the first coming sounds a lot like the second coming, Right. I think it's I think it's possible that the that the devil and his angels thought that Christ had come to rule the nations when in fact he had come to redeem the sons and daughters of Adam. And if we think practical about redeeming the sons of daughters of Adam, does that mean that Satan owns the transaction in the garden? We are indentured. No, we're indentured. 
it, in the in the in the terminology of are the we Bible, genetically indentured to him? So, no, we are indentured to the swineherd. Understand that when we are condemned, we are not condemned alone. We are condemned with the devil. The Bible says that hell was created for the devil and his angels. We, when we commit, when we become insur- insurgent to the kingdom of heaven, disobedient, unfaithful to God through sin, we have thrown our lot in with the insurrectionists. We have thrown our lot in with the rebels, and we will therefore be condemned with them. So our condemnation is not an individual com- condemnation. It's not a human condemna- condemnation. It's a collective condemnation. We're condemned with all of the enemies of God from the beginning. And we sub- when we subject ourselves to sin, when we allow sin to take root in our lives, we all know that we become uh, that we are become easily manipulated. We now can be easily manipulated through temptation. And so we have become now, we are now indentured to the devil. We are condemned with him and we are subject now to his temptation and manipulation. He does not own us. However, I will say this, there is a dynamic here that the, that's talked about in the New Testament. I talk about in my book where those who are, who reject Christ are, the offspring are considered the offspring of the devil. In other words, we are like, we're like his children rather than God's. We're brought back into the family through Christ. But in our original context, when we're born, when we, when we come through the womb in the, in the natal blood, roiling in the natal blood, as, the, as one of the prophets says in the Old Testament, we are in a condition of enmity with God. And that is a biblical fact. We are born in the, into the human condition, and the human condition is enmity with God, sin, and death. So we're born into the same condition, this condition of enmity that the devil's in. He's the enemy of God. So we're born in the wrong camp. When we come roiling out of our mother's womb and roiling in the natal blood and water out of our mother's womb, we are in the devil's camp. We are con- automatically condemned because of the sin of Adam with the devil. So we're with him from the beginning. Okay, we're with him. We are in his camp. And so we can be considered a part of his family rather than a part of the kingdom of heaven and those who are loyal to God. So in the course of our life, when we choose to believe in the Son of God, you see, that's the commandment of God. The commandment of the Father is to believe in the Son. That's the commandment of the Father. So when we believe in Christ, we put our faith in Christ, then we are rescued. We are redeemed from uh, the swine herd. That's exactly what, in the context of the prodigal son, we are liberated from the condemnation of the devil. And we no longer are enemies with God because through the cross, peace is made with God. That's called reconciliation. So we're redeemed through Christ so that we, we might be reconciled. And reconciled means be brought back into friendship, be brought back into fellowship with God. So reconciliation with God is the prodigal son being brought back home. Who does that? Jesus does. He comes and brings us to be where he is with his father. And that obviously can take place because he purchased us. He paid our penalty, the penalty of our sin. He paid it. He absolved us and he brought us back into friendship and reconciliation. This is the glory of the gospel of Christ And so there's a dynamic, and this is a dynamic that theologians talk about all the time, that we are in a state of, we're in a process of being being brought back into the family of God, a process which is not finished until the resurrection. The resurrection seals us. We are then officially brought back into the family. Because remember, as the prodigal son is approaching the father's house, what happens? The father runs out to meet him, and then the, the son, before he enters the father's house. He's clothed with new garments. New sandals are put on his feet. This is the resurrection. This is the righteousness of Christ, the resurrection. And once we are brought back, uh, before we are fully reinstated in the family of God, we are reborn in Christ, reset the original blueprint of Adam without Adam's sin, without the guilt of Adam's sin, brought back into the family of God, brought back into fellowship with God, as opposed to what? As opposed to being condemned with the devil as opposed to being um, judged and condemned with Satan and his insurrectionary forces. 
So if you understand this from biblical context, that when you are born, when you draw breath on earth, I don't care who you are, when you draw breath on earth, you are, you are born into the devil's camp. You are, subject, you are subjected to the swineherd, to sin and the manipulation of sin and the consequence of sin. But when you are, but when you're redeemed in Christ through the cross and reconciled to the family of God, now the righteousness of Christ covers your sins, and you're going to literally be born again. And by the way, that's what being born again means. Born again through the resurrection and not born into a different, a different body or not born into a different species or something like that. You're going to be uh, reborn in the reset to the genetic blueprint of Adam before the fall. And you think Satan knew this happened he understood that he'd been sort of. Uh, the Bible says that if the powers knew, the, the, they would have. They would have never. Killed they would have him, never yeah. crucified. But I mean, Christ. after it happens, they after it happens, didn't realize that they were facilitating the redemption of mankind. The I think they were completely fooled that they thought that they were defeating Christ. That Christ had come. He had come. Remember, this is the dragon slayer being born. This the devil's prime objective is to foil the dragon slayer prophecy, which some people call the, the seed of the serpent prophecy or the seed war or whatever. This is the devil's primary objective is to is to forestall his fate. So when he sees Christ, the promised offspring, the promised human being born from the virgin womb of a daughter of Eve. So the promised son of Adam born through the virgin womb of daughter of Eve. This was the dragon slayer who was being yeah. born into the world. And what was the dragon slayer going to do according to the prophecy? Crush Satan's head. And so the devil went about trying to defeat Jesus. by the. He didn't try to kill him first. He tried to cause him to defect, to turn coat. He, I'll give you the nations. I'll give them to you. So he wakes up three days later from this hangover. Is his, does his dominion change after those three days? The question is, did, did his influence begin to wane? Yes, wait? that's what I, what did I say? Because the devil's, the devil's dominion did not I change. I said dominion. I said well, dominion. Wait, I, I, meant, I meant influence. I meant like the way he operates. No, because the emperors of Rome were, were burning human beings in Roman candles at the entrance to their palaces. They cover them in tar and burn them alive. They were sacrificing Christians to the, in, uh, in the, I mean, they were feeding Christians to the lions and the jackals and the hyenas in the, uh, in the Colosseum. The so they didn't, really, they didn't really understand why he was coming so if, the first if time. So the, if the authority that the devil had accrued through the willful abdication of humanity uh, had been dissolved, had been annulled at the resurrection of Christ, then how did he have the authority? How did he have the influence to persecute the saints so viciously for the next few centuries? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was through the devil's influence that these, that these emperors of Rome were drunk on the blood of the saints. And not only the emperors of Rome, by the way, but the popes of Rome yeah. and the Inquisition, which lasted for six Hundred years. Uh, the Inquisition was inaugurated to destroy the elements of Christianity that were breaking from the Pope. The what I wanted to say was that the Jesuit order was inaugurated to destroy the Reformation. The Inquisition was inaugurated to destroy the Waldenses and Abergenses that were uh, propagating in Europe, who were did not believe in the authority of the Pope and so forth. So the Inquisition, we can say, was uh, inaugurated to destroy the what we can consider to be the seeds of the Protestant Reformation. And then the Jesuits were inaugur inaugurated, specifically tasked with the destruction of the Protestant uh, Reformation and destroy the Protestant believers and, and ultimately the Protestant churches to infiltrate and destroy Protestantism in the world. That's why the Jesuits were, were inaugurated, getting off topic a little bit here. The point is, that the devil's influence in the world was very prominent and vibrant through the centuries that preceded Christ's death. So this notion that there were sons of God, fallen angels ruling over the nations until Jesus died, and then once Jesus died, they were no longer ruling over the nations, that the premise is not correct. They were never ruling over nations. They had a degree of influence over the nations because of paganism, because of idolatry, and one can say that that influence did indeed wane, 
over time. And it waned because of Christianity. But it took a long time for that influence to wane in South America and North America and China and, you know, Germania and distant reaches of, of the earth that were outside of the influence of Christianity. And then you have a whole new enemy of, of Christianity arising in Mohammedism, in Islam. So I'm just asking everybody to think practically here. Let's think in terms of reality and recorded history and reverse engineer the scenario going back to Christ. Now, do I believe in the Deuteronomy 32 worldview? Yes, but I don't take it literally. I don't believe that there were literal gods ruling over the nations because that is not what we have in the record of human history. We have human beings ruling over the nations. Sometimes those human beings are good and sometimes they're bad. Even in the case of Israel, you have Saul and then you have David and then you have Solomon and then you have a series of kings who are both good and bad who do both righteous things and abominable things. Yahweh never seated himself on David's throne, but guess what? The Son of God will be seated on the throne of David and will rule the nations. Why will he do this? Because he is a son of man. Because he is a son of man. Because he is a son of man. To wrap it up, when will Satan get to sit on the throne and why and how? At the end of the age, the beast directs the exaltation of mankind to his father, the dragon. The dragon gives the beast his authority because there's a level of authority that the dragon has. And he gives it to him. And the beast in turn abdicates his authority to the dragon. So there's this shared authority between father and son. The nations, the, the, the dragon influences mankind to worship the beast and the beast directs the adulation to his father. Is this not, is this not what Christ did? Yeah. The father directs mankind to believe in his son and even to worship his son. And the son, in turn, directs the adulation of mankind back to his father. This is exactly what the dragon mm. does and the beast at the end of the age. And so this is a mirror of the father and his son. This is a mirror of the, our heavenly father and his son, Jesus. It's mirrored in the dragon and the beast, who I believe, again, is going to be the hybrid progeny of the dragon. Hybrid progeny, meaning that the dragon, who is, again, a member of the elder race, is going to copulate with a human wo woman and give birth to a human hybrid son who will occupy a human throne and there and the devil will, will therefore have direct proximal authority over the earth through his son. Yeah, same thing, same story. And this is exactly what happened in Genesis 6 which we've discussed. Yeah. That proximal authority of the watchers which they wielded through their sons who were human enough to occupy the thrones of Adam. This is what's going to happen at the end of the age with the beast. And what does it say about the beast that he is permitted to rule? He's given three and a half years. He's permitted to rule. Who permits him to rule? God permits him to rule because he's human enough to appropriate the authority of Adam and, and govern the and literally govern the nations, not, not influence the nations, but govern the nations. So circling back to the Deuteronomy 32 worldview, do I subscribe to the Deuteronomy 32 worldview? Yes and no. Yes, I do that there is a rule by proxy <laughs> dynamic happening there. No, I do not believe that the nations were turned over to the direct rule or governance of anything other than a human being. So here's my last question. Is the end sort of like a Tower of Babel scenario to go all full circle back to Eden where the son of Satan, the beast, is going to try to have a war with heaven through some sort of portal, some sort of thing where Armageddon is going to be like the the... the Storming the gates of heaven to take it over. Armageddon is kinetic war with the kingdom of heaven. And nothing less. It's not just war with Israel. It's war with God. Yeah. Like, like, Will there be an attempt to storm the gates of heaven? Will the dragon marshal his forces and try and storm the gates of heaven at the end of the age? Very possibly so. But what I can tell you for sure is that the beast is definitely, and the dragon, are definitely taking a defensive posture on earth. Why? Why are they taking a defensive posture on earth? Because they know somebody's coming. The king is coming. Mm. They know the king is coming. And so I believe Armageddon is more of a defensive posture to resist the return of the king of heaven, who is now coming to literally and physically and Sit functionally the govern the nations. 
from the throne of David mm. as a mm. as as an as the as a member of the human race, a son of Adam. He has all authority on earth, and he's coming to govern. And that's why, by the way, he the scroll. And we can get into that in another talk. I think we've touched on that in the past. Is that that's what that scroll represents in heaven that John sees? It's the dominion of it's the deed of earth. It's the deed of earth, and it's and only Christ at that time, because I believe the earth is going to be under a po- is going to be mainly under the the inhabitants of the earth are going to be primarily overwhelmingly post human at that point, and mankind is going to lose his dominion on earth. And that is with the post-human agenda, by the way. And so, yes, so, the, so, so I think what we're doing here is we, we are taking concepts that we all agree. And you don't have to agree with me, by the way. This is all my opinion. I could definitely be wrong, and I have no problem with being wrong. And what I'm doing is I'm, and I'm not angry, and I'm not trying to be forceful. I just get- um, Passion, Passionate. Passionate is the word I'm looking for. I get passionate, and so that's what you hear in my voice. You're not hearing anger. I'm not trying to force my views down your throat. You can take them or leave them. But when I talk about these things, you're going to hear a level of passion in my voice because that you won't hear if I'm talking about other things, because this is the gospel of Christ. And these are things that, that have ramifications for the human race uh, that I think are, are, are not very well contemplated, generally speaking, and that it's time for us to start thinking about these things in practical terms, pragmatic terms. Because they're coming. They're coming out of the sky. Exactly. <laughs> so that we can move away from sort of a medieval superstitious view of things and start moving into more functional physical reality and how things are operating in, in terms of, let's call it the physics of the kingdom, because that's what we're talking about here. The rules of the game, according to the kingdom, the devil is not free to do whatever he wants willy nilly. That's not how the kingdom of God operates. He's allowed to do what he has been authorized to do. A, by God, and B, by us. The authority that he tempted Christ with, the, the nations, the authority of the nations that he tempted Christ with, that authority was given to him by mankind through an idolatrous relationship that they had through his aspects in Jupiter and Zeus. And that is the way he has operated through the centuries. It is the way he will operate and because it's the only way he's allowed to operate. And so bringing us up to modern times, is Joe Biden and uh, Barack Obama and the Pope and uh, all these other world leaders, are they going to Antarctica or somewhere under the earth and having and, and holding conference with the devil? No, they're not. They are completely influenced by, in some cases, completely influenced by the devil through idolatry, through Luciferianism and have abdicated their authority and are willfully, willfully beseeching the influence and direction of the kingdom of darkness and are therefore being to some degree influenced and directed by the kingdom of darkness um, and are then subjecting nations to that influence. Yes, all of that is happening. And by the way, let me say as a final parting note here, <laughs> the devil does not have authority over outer space. He does not have authority over the stratosphere. We, 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 we have this notion that the devil is the prince of the powers of the air, and therefore, he has authority up in the sky. That is, a, that is not what the prince of the power of the air means. The power of the air means the influence, the saturating influence of Satan that permeated every facet of society, which was completely given to paganism, specifically to Jupiter and Zeus. And that's what Paul meant when he said the prince of the power of the air. It was like saying the prince of the power of the atmosphere. Every corner, there's an idol being worshipped. There's a god being worshipped. There's a statue of this god or that god. It was this complete and total saturation of power over the minds of men that uh, the devil was enjoying at that time in human history. And I say that to say that that's not why UFOs are allowed to fly around in the sky, because that's the devil's domain. It is no more the devil's domain. The, the stratosphere is no more the devil's domain than the Pacific Ocean. Hmm. In other words, boats that, that are navigating the ocean are no more under the influence of the devil than UFOs that are navigating the, uh, or I should say airplanes uh, that are navigating the heavens. Man, Tim. Well, it's heavy. Is, is, the, is the devil's son already born? 
I don't know. Uh, I think not, but uh, but I don't know. I think the devil's coming. At, <laughs> the Antichrist is coming at the end of the age. Why do I think that? Six times six times six is two hundred and sixteen. In other words, you can add a zero onto that, which is often a it's it's a it's a, a, a common thing in the ancient world to add a zero to the em, num, the, the end of numbers to get a larger number, der, a derivation of that number, which would be two thousand one hundred and sixty, which is a precessional age. So the age that we are in now, the processional age that we are in now is the age of Pisces. When that age is completed, then we are at the end of the age, the very end of the age that Christ talked about, 2,160 years, in my estimation, from the birth of Christ. So are we in the end of the age? Indeed, we are. Are we at the very end of the age? No. The beast is going to arise at the very end of the age. We're given this number in 666. Calculate the number of the beast. Six, not 666, six times six times six mm-hmm. hardcore which is yeah. which is by my calculation 216 is it not which is 2000 which is a derivation 2160 look it up that's a processional age I love it, and, a, and and that's a whole other conversation we have at a later yeah, date. It is. <laughs> the precession of the equinoxes the priest will never end measure the ages of the earth that's how they knew that the king of heaven was being born on earth that's how the wise men knew that and uh, some conjunctions some great conjunctions that were happening with the planets and also i believe a comet and they knew that the king the greatest king of all was being born that his birth was going to inaugurate the age of pisces and that a new age would be inaugurated at the end of the age of pisces and it is at the end of this very age that christ talked about the end of the age the end of his age the age of pisces that the beast would arise and if that's true and jesus was born in in, in the year let's say i don't know 4 bc which i think is when he was born uh, between 4 and 6 bc let's just call it 1 a.d it's close enough right that means that in the year 2166 uh 160 or somewhere in that range 2155 the year 2155 will literally be the end of the age that christ talked about so i think we're within a couple generations of the very end of the age Right on, Tim. Thank you so is. much, man. Tim Stradamus. <laughs> Tim and, uh, and then, you know, I can go, we can come on later and I can talk about yeah. some amazing prophecies regarding Christ related to the procession of the equinoxes, which people think is pagan. It's not pagan. It's the time clock that God set into place from the very beginning and that Adam knew about. Tim, I, th- I still think you get just as passionate talking about Bigfoot. But <laughs> I-, I know what happens. It's, no, uh, dude, there we go. You just teased the next show too. The uh, that, that may in fact be true. Biblical prophecy, <laughs> biblical prophecy with Tim Alberino. Next time yeah. on Blurry Creatures. Well, thanks, Tim, Tim. Tim, thanks, thanks again for just for for opening up your brain. And, and thanks, thanks again, guys. Obviously for having having me on uh, so many times, and and uh, for in, for tolerating my stream of thought and sucking all the oxygen out of the room, and and interrupting and interjecting. Uh, it's just uh, you guys. You guys. You wind me up, and uh, it's it's hard to uh, <laughs> wait till this, ha- wait till this happens myself. in person. Wait till this happens in person. It's gonna it's, no, actually <laughs> it's in gonna person. Be fun. I'm extremely sedated and quiet. I'll believe it when I see it. Body by Tim. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tim, appreciate it. Um, you know, we started the show talking about what you have coming um, with the with, with the show, and we're excited to look ahead to that. You know, you have your crews out there. Uh, anything else you wanna you wanna leave us with before we uh, we end this iteration of Tim Aubrey on Blurry Creatures before the next? No, I think I've said enough. <laughs> okay, all right. And I just re- again th- thank you, fellas, for having me on. And it's great, to, great to anytime. Have you, yep. Yeah, man. Great to have you. Thanks. Appreciate it. All right, guys. Thanks, Tim. All right.